And what they were looking for was, does success breed motivation? Do the students who just perform well spend more time on these new questions than the students who just performed poorly? And here's what they found. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's From Theory to Practice where I take a look at the research so you don't have to. Now the article I've selected this week is called Divergent Consequences of Success and Failure in Japan and North America by Heaney and colleagues. Now this paper hinges on a truism that you're probably familiar with, so see if this resonates with you. Success breeds confidence, confidence breeds motivation, therefore success breeds motivation. Now this is a very common statement in the learning sciences, and for good reason. We tend to see this everywhere. Just look at American sports. So the NFL, the most popular sports league in North America, every year the two best teams face off in the Super Bowl. One team wins and one team loses. Now watch what happens the following season. It turns out that the team that won the Super Bowl has significantly outperformed the team that lost the Super Bowl in seven out of the last 10 years averaging a 0.124 better win percentage. So it makes sense, the team that won the Super Bowl gained motivation and did even better the next year. The team that lost the Super Bowl lost motivation and started to perform more poorly. Well that's one thing the authors of this paper wanted to find out. Can we see the same pattern with student motivation? So what they did is they got 155 students from North America and they asked them all to perform what's called a random association task. Now how this works is pretty simple. You're presented with three words and you have to come up with one word that is somehow common to the other three. So for instance, if you're presented with cottage, Swiss, and cake, the answer is cheese. Cottage cheese, Swiss cheese, and cheesecake. So what these researchers did is they first had these students go through and perform a series of these random associations. But the trick is, one group of students got incredibly easy RATs, while the other group of students got incredibly difficult RATs. So what these researchers were doing was they were essentially setting up one group for success and one group for failure. Now here's where the test came in. After these different students performed these tasks, they were all then presented with another sheet of random associations, and they were just told, hey, you can work on these for as long as you want to, fair game, just do your best. And what they were looking for was, does success breed motivation? Do the students who just perform well spend more time on these new questions than the students who just performed poorly? And here's what they found. The students from the easy group spent an average of 10 and a half minutes trying to complete the new random associations, while the kids in the hard group spent only seven and a half minutes. So here we just demonstrated success breeds motivation. But that's not where these researchers ended. Heaney and colleagues said, wait, different cultures think differently about success. In North America, we are strongly focused on self-actualization, figuring out who we are and being the best us we can be. But in Japan, self-actualization is somewhat different. In Japan, people are less likely to focus on their own strengths and they tend to focus on their weaknesses. The key to self-actualization is finding out what you're poor at and enhancing and increasing those skills. And in fact, we can see this in Japanese sports. In seven out of the last 10 years of the Japanese baseball league, the most popular sports league in Japan, the loser of the championship game went on to outperform the winner the following year with a win percentage of 0.11 greater. We couldn't do diddly poo offensively. We sucked. So here, loss was driving motivation. So these researchers then had 194 different Japanese students perform the same tasks. Some had an easy RAT, some had a hard, and then we wanted to see how long would they spend on another set of associations. And what they found was the Japanese students from the easy group spent only seven and a half minutes on these new associations, while those in the hard group spent 11 and a half minutes. So here we see in this specific group of students, success didn't breed motivation, failure bred motivation. Now in a final twist, these researchers had students do another set of random associations, except this time they started with a quick disclaimer. The American students were told that performance on this task requires effort, and the more you struggle, the better you're going to do. While Japanese students were told performance on this task is inherent. Either you're good at it or you're bad at it, no use working hard. And what did they find? After being primed with effort, the American students spent about nine and a half minutes working on the new associations, so that's a boost of about two minutes, while the Japanese, after being primed with an inherent skill narrative, 
only spent about 10 minutes, still more than the North Americans, but about a minute and a half less than before. So let's bring this back. What does all of this mean for us as teachers? Well, I can think of three things. And the first is this. Motivation isn't a one-size-fits-all model. Here with this research, we're starting to see different people are motivated for different reasons. There can be nothing so simple as success makes people work harder. So this just highlights, as you already know, the importance of getting to know our students. Can we tap into their stories and learn what truly drives and motivates them? Maybe some kids need an easy win before we go more difficult, and maybe some kids need to dive into the deep end and that's what's gonna push them forward. And the second thing I can think of hinges off the back of this is that culture matters. In an earlier video, we were talking about this idea of stratification, and now we see culture is a massive stratifier. As the world becomes more global and our students become more international, we're going to compete with different cultural stories which are greatly going to influence what our students focus on, how they choose to work, what strategies they employ. So perhaps a lot of our psychological explanations and tools we use with students might need to change based on their culture of origin. Now the third thing I can think of concerns strength-based teaching. So there's a big movement now, you've probably heard of it, strength-based education, where we find what kids are good at and we push that. And from this paper we see, yeah, that might be great for some students, but that might be negative for others. So if we're considering this strength-based education model, it's not simple enough to say, what are you good at? Let's do that. We've got to determine what our students' strengths are and use those to push into their weaknesses. Knowing that I'm good at X can be used to help me better at Y and Z and A and B. Maybe that becomes the doorway that opens up so that I face and am more motivated to tackle things that I otherwise find difficult. Now there's one last take home too I've been thinking about and it's here. It's a difference between aptitude and development. So in the United States, in the West, our culture, we love aptitude. And this is how we measure students with aptitude tests. You take an IQ test, how good are you? That determines what school you go to, what programs you get into, off you go. But here we see other cultures that don't focus on aptitude might struggle with our Western form of testing. To them, strengths might not be a meaningful area of focus, and instead they want exams that show who's more determined to improve their skills, who's more willing to focus on their weaknesses and bring those up out of the depths. Now, seeing as IQ tests measure aptitude and not a development, we kind of are reverted back to this nature versus nurture question and how this is being measured or at least defined across cultures. Now that's way too big of a topic to hit in this video, but I promise you in the next couple weeks, we'll hit a series of videos where we look at this question. So a big topic, a lot we can look forward to in the future. But thank you all so much for hanging out with me. I hope you got something from that. And if you like what you saw, if you can give us a thumbs up and subscribe below, it'll make sure more people get a chance to see this video on YouTube. Otherwise, thank you so much for hanging out with me. I'll see you guys next time. Bye y'all.